we've had one word that we've been using to describe this year. Do you remember what it is? This year is a what year? A stretch year. Good. I'm, I was really nervous you weren't going to remember that. I was like, oh man, if we're at the end of the year and you don't know what kind of a year this was, we're in serious trouble. It was a stretch year where we were challenging ourselves to be intentional in stretching more fully into God's calling and design on us and design for us as a church. And we gave ourselves uh, five specific areas where we wanted to stretch. We wanted to stretch in our giving. We took an offering, a day's wage offering at the beginning of the year, and we challenged ourselves to really give in such a way as to meet the budget that, got, that, that we had set. And part of that was uh, we're, we're in our third year of being financially self-sustaining, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, but we really needed to stretch. We needed to get to that place. So we challenged ourselves in giving. We challenged ourselves in serving. And the challenge was everybody needed to be serving in one ministry. And for some people, that meant finding a ministry to serve in. For others, it meant actually pairing back from five ministries to one. And the reason that we did that was uh, not just to, not to limit ourselves, but to focus ourselves and to create space for some of the other challenges. The third challenge was community. We wanted everybody to engage in some level of community, whether that was a connecting group, a life group, a men's ministry, a women's ministry. We wanted everybody to be connected relationally in some way, shape, or form. The fourth challenge was encouragement. We wanted people to be actively practicing that, encourage one another all the day, all the more as we see the day approaching. We need to be encouraging each other. And then the last challenge that we wanted to create space for was to stretch and sharing our faith. That we wanted to be able to go out and start engaging and building relationships, throwing parties, inviting people over, not maybe necessarily sharing the gospel right up, but, but building those relationships, creating those opportunities where hopefully God opens those doors where we get the opportunity to tell people about Jesus. So that's been what we've been calling ourselves to as a church. And here we are, we're finishing up this year. And what I want to say to you this morning is even as we end this year and we launch with a whole new focus the next ministry year, God's not done stretching us. If we get to the end of this year and we go, oh goodness, we're done stretching, thank goodness that's over, we actually have misunderstood the reality of the Christian life. Because here's, here's Philippians chapter 3, Paul puts it this way, he says, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize, listen, of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The sense from that verse is this, there's always an upward call. God's never done where he's like, okay, you've gone far enough, just go ahead and just chill. You don't have to worry about pressing on. No, God is always, there's always the upward call. There's always a sense of God calling us forward. He always wants us in a place where he's stretching us. And the reason that he wants to keep stretching us Two reasons, actually. Number one, because he wants to keep growing us. And you need to hear this. Growth happens when you stretch. God wants to grow you, and growth happens when you stretch. But the second thing, and the thing we're focusing on in this series is this. God also wants to bless and reward you. And that also happens in the context of a stretch. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells a parable known as the parable of the talents. Some of you will know this parable. And the story goes that there's a master who's about to leave on a journey. He's going to be gone for a while. We don't know how long. He doesn't say, but he's going to be gone. And before he leaves, he entrusts each one of his servants with a certain amount of his money. And then he goes away. And he's given his servants his money not so they can just hold on to it and not so they can spend it on themselves, but so that they'll take it and invest it. It's business. He's saying, this is my money. I want you to grow my money while I'm gone, and then I'm going to come back. And he does. After an unspecified amount of time, he's been gone, we sense, for a long time. He comes back to his servants to settle accounts, and the question that he asks is, what did you do with what I gave you? And we could kind of think of that question this way, that the master comes back, and the question he asks is this, how did you stretch? How did you stretch? Did you step into the calling that I placed onto your life fully, or did you settle for something less? And what he finds is, he finds one servant who doesn't stretch, and we'll talk about him later on in this series, but two of his servants, they stretch, they take it, and they multiply it. And Jesus says that the master responds, and of course this is a picture, he's illustrating himself in this moment. The master responds and says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful because you've been faithful with a little. I will place you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. 
Now, our tendency, it's a, it's a, everything that's in that, those statements, it's just beautiful, but our tendency is to just focus on the first thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. The first thing the master does is give affirmation. Hey, you did a great job. You did, you did it. Well done. And we all long for that. We tend to focus on that because we long to one day stand before Jesus. At least I know I do, and I'm guessing that you do. We want to stand before Jesus one day and hear him say to us, you did a great job. Well done. But see, Jesus doesn't stop there. That's not all the master says. He does, he does affirm, well done, good and faithful servant, but he keeps going. What does he say? He says, because you've been faithful with a little. In other words, I gave you a little bit to take care of, and you did what you were supposed to. You were responsible and faithful with that. Because of that, the master says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reward you. Now, we get nervous talking about rewards in Christianity because we understand that salvation is on the basis of grace and we start getting worried that we're going to treat Jesus like a gas station or a, uh, or a grocery store, right? They have rewards programs, and the whole idea of the rewards programs is about selfish motivation to get you to shop there, right? If you shop here and you use our rewards program, we're going to give you more money so that you can spend, you know, when you come and buy things, you get your points, and then you get to actually have, you know, spend less because the points go towards you buying more things. It's all about selfish motivation, and when we start talking about rewards, we get a little bit nervous that people are going to treat Jesus that way, where there, our relationship with him is going to become about selfish motivation, where our primary question is, what's in it for me? But I want you to hear this. Jesus does reward but his rewards are different than those kind of rewards, and his motivation in those rewards are radically different than the selfish motivation. And if you want to understand it, listen to what the master says. He says, well done, good and faithful servant, because you've been faithful over with a little. Here, says, here, here it is. I will now place you over much. In other words, Jesus' reward for faithful, responsible service is more responsibility. He doesn't go, hey, because you've been faithful, go on a vacation. Hey, hey because you've been faithful, uh, we're going to give you a percentage off the, you know, the whole giving requirement thing. We'll, we'll just give you some money off of that. Or, hey, take some breaks off from Sunday because you've earned it. Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't say, here's the reward for you. Go be selfish. He says, here's the reward. I am going to bless you so that you can be a greater blessing. I said the word responsibility, but here's how we really need to think about it. God's rewards, when we're faithful with what he gives us, he blesses us with more opportunity. He says, you've been faithful with this, now let me give you even more to be faithful with. But here's the deal. God wants to do that. He wants to bless you with more so you can be a greater blessing, but the context of experiencing that is in the stretch. And the question that you have to ask yourself is this. Am I going to keep stretching, or am I going to settle for something less? And what we're going to do over these five weeks is we're going to look at each one of those five places that we challenge ourselves to stretch, not to look back and go, how did we do, but to look forward and ask this, what are we going to do? And this morning, the place we're going to start is we're going to start by looking at giving. Would you stand with me? Let's take a look at this passage. First, First Chronicles chapter 29. For those who are visiting, whenever we read Scripture, we stand together because we want to honor, we believe this is God's Word, and we stand in honor to God's Word. Before we read it, let me pray for us. Father God, thank you for being able to be here together this morning. Thank you for being able to worship and sing praise to your name. And thank you that we get to open your Word this morning and hear from you, that this is your Word. It's not man's Word about you. It's your Word to us in which you want to open our eyes first and foremost, to show us you so that we might know you and have a relationship with you. And secondly, in knowing you, that we might actually obey and walk in your ways, that we might experience life in the context of your salvation by grace through your Son. So Lord, teach us this morning. I believe you want to keep stretching us, God, and I, I pray that we would understand, especially as we talk about giving, God, we wrestle with this, we struggle with this, and you know it. And for some of us, this is, a, this is an issue that we've, we've maybe not dealt with in the way you want us to. And so, God, I pray that you would teach us this morning and not just give us understanding, but a heart that says yes to whatever it is that you call us to. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, take a look. First Chronicles chapter 29, we're going to start in verse 1. 
And David the king said to all the assembly, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great, for the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. So I have provided for the house of my God so far as I was able the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, the wood for the things of wood, besides great quantities of onyx and stones for settings, antimony, colored stones, all sorts of precious stones and marble. Moreover, in addition to all that, I have provided for the holy house. I have a treasure of my own gold and silver, and because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give it to the house of my God. 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for overlaying the walls of the house and for all the work to be done by craftsmen, gold for the things of gold and silver for the things of silver. Who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? Then the leaders of fathers' houses made their freewill offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes and commanders of thousands and of hundreds, and the officers over the king's work. They gave for the service of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord in the care of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced because they had willing, given willingly for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. This is God's word. You can go ahead and be seated. We're going to actually look at the next 10 verses as well as we go, but we're going to stop there because that really sets for us the whole stage of everything that's taking place in this passage. And let me, there's four things I want to walk through with you this morning, but before we get there, let me set the context because you, you jump in and, and it can feel a little bit confusing what's happening here. The context is that David, who is the second king of Israel, the first good king of Israel, is coming towards the end of his life. So he's about to die and his son Solomon is about to take over as the king. And Solomon has a pretty big task ahead of him because what they're talking about here in 1 Chronicles 29 is building a temple. Now, the, the temple idea originated, it's God's plan, it's God's vision, but here's, if you read back a little bit, back into chapter 28, a little bit further, you'll find out that David had actually come up with, with this idea that he wanted to build a, a temple as a resting place for the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, you, it goes way, it goes back in the history of Israel, was a, it was a symbol, it was more than a symbol, but it was a symbol of God's presence with his people, and it literally was a place that God would come and meet with his people. On the top of the Ark of the Covenant was what was known as the mercy seat. Sacrifice would be made and blood would be sprinkled to atone for sin on the top of the mercy seat, and God's presence would come down, and that was the place that he would meet with his people. And up to this point in time, the Ark of the Covenant was all over the place. It was moving from place to place to place, and David is saying, I don't want people to have to go out and find where it is, I want there to be this place where everybody knows that's where God's presence is. So I want to build a temple. And God responds to David and says, uh, I don't need a house. I'm not a pagan God who needs some building in order to live. Like the world is all of mine. It's all mine. At the same time, God says, but the temple's going to be built. It's just you're not going to build it. David's come up with the idea, but God says, here's who's going to build it. Your son Solomon is going to build it. Now David could have gotten you know, frustrated with God and said, that's not fair. I came up with the idea. I want to be involved in building the temple, but he doesn't. Instead, he says, okay, Solomon's going to build the temple. That doesn't mean I can't be a part of helping prepare so that when Solomon goes to work, he can succeed. And so we come to chapter 28. In chapter 28, he's casting the vision of the building of the temple to all the people. And then in chapter 29, he's doing a building campaign. That's really what's happening. He's going, hey, listen, the vision is we're going to build a temple but in order for us to build this temple, we've got to give. And quite literally, he's saying what we have to do is stretch. And the reason that we can say they've got to stretch is because you need to understand that if you look back through all of the Old Testament to this point in time, the people of Israel are already tithing, and they're tithing somewhere to between 20 to 30 percent. Now, I want you to just let that sink in for just a moment. Do you know that the average church attender, do you know what the average church attender gives percentage-wise right now in the U.S.? 2%. That's the average. At this point in time in the history of Israel, they're tithing somewhere to between 20 to 30% of their income already. And now David comes and he says, hey, we're going to build a temple for the 
Ark of the Covenant. But here's the deal. I'm not going to dip back into the 20 and 30%. It's not like, okay, well, we're already tithing. That's what we'll use. You already have all of that. Use that. No, David says we got to go above and beyond that. If we're going to build the temple, here's what we've got to do. We've got to stretch, which is exactly where God wants them. God wants to stretch them, and he's going to challenge them in their giving. And I want you to hear this. God wants to stretch you, and he wants to consistently challenge you in your giving. And I'll show you why as we go. But this is not an easy thing. This is a struggle for everyone. And the question is this, how do we get to the place where when God says, I want you to stretch in your giving, that we're ready to say yes, we're ready to give willingly and with a joyful heart because that's exactly what these people do in this moment is they're giving 20 to 30% and, and David comes and says, we've got to do even more. They don't go, oh man, you're always asking for money. It says that they give willingly and with joyful hearts. How do we get to that place when it comes to our giving? Because that's where God wants to stretch us to. And I believe in this passage we're getting some of those answers. And there's four things that I want to I, I share with you this morning as I look at this passage. Four things that we need if we're going to stretch in our giving. All right? Number one, if you're going to stretch in your giving, <clears throat> God's vision you must choose God's vision over your own. Go ahead and put up that first point for me, will you? You have to choose God's vision over your own. It has to become your priority. Here David comes to the people and they're already giving, as I've said, and he says, we need to give even more. And I want you to put yourself in their shoes just for a moment here. And I want to ask you, how would you, what's your knee-jerk reaction to that? Would you go, oh, more? Absolutely. Or would maybe you be going, hey, listen, you know what? The temple, great idea, sounds really cool, but here's the deal. I'm actually not going to be involved on this one. If we look at every single person involved, everybody would have had good reasons, or at least plausible reasons to go, yeah, I'm not going to be a part of this one. I mean, let's just start with David. David could have said, no, I'm not going to really be involved in this. Everybody else can give to this, but not me. Why? Well, first of all, because he came up with the idea and God said, no, Solomon's going to build it. And you know what would have been easy? I mean, David's at the point of retirement. I mean, he's coming to the end of his life, and now Solomon's the one who's going to build the temple. You know what David could have said? You know what? That's for the younger people. I'm not even going to be alive when the temple's built. Why in the world would I give to that? It's not for me. It's retirement time. I'm going to live off my golden parachute. You guys handle this. Everybody else needs to give to it. That's what David could have said. How about the leaders? Because they're the next ones who give. They could have said, hey, you know what? We're already giving. Uh, and here's the deal. Part of, part of what we're giving is our time and energy to leadership. I mean, we get it. Temple, great idea. But we think everybody else should do that. That should be on the people because we're already leading and serving so much. That's our offering to God. So don't come and ask us for money. Let's let somebody else handle that. And how about the people? People could have been like, look, we're not rich and we're already tithing 20 to 30%. I mean, the king's got all the money. Why doesn't he build the temple on his own? Why is he coming to us? And not only that, you think about Israel's history. This is the first time where they've actually really had peace. Up to this point, they've been in slavery, then they were wandering, and then they get to the land, and everybody's doing whatever they want. It's a huge mess, and people are coming in, them, in and always attacking. And then they had their first king, Saul, who brought them, sent them out to war, and was everybody, you know, it, it was a disaster. Now they've got David, and he's a good king, and it's great, but hey, we're finally settling down for the first time, and you want more money? Like, here's the deal. We've got families, and we've got kids to raise, and bills to pay, and colleges to send our kids to. Here's the deal. Let us build up our savings account and get settled in, and then you come back to us and ask us for some money, and we'll see where we're at. Do you see what I'm saying? Everybody at every stage of life has lots of priorities, lots of things that are pulling at their, at their money, if you will, and everybody could have a plausible reason to say, no, I, I'm not going to be involved in this. The only way that you say yes, the only way you stretch is two things. Number one is if the vision is actually God's vision. And two, if God's vision is actually your priority. That's the only way you're going to stretch. I, I remember a man coming to me uh, some time ago to confess his giving habits. And I believe he came to confess to me because he thought he knew, he thought that I knew what his giving habits were. And I just want to say up front to you, I don't know what you give. So if you're sitting here going, oh, Dan's giving this message because of me, I have no idea what you give. I don't. And, and by the way, that is an intentional choice. 
I decided early on as a pastor that I didn't, know, I didn't want to know what anybody gave to the church. And the reason I don't want to know is because I don't ever want to be tempted to treat anybody differently based on what they give. That's between you and God. I let God do that business. That's not my business. So I don't know what you give. But he came thinking I knew what he gave, and he's feeling guilty because he wasn't giving. And he came and he said, Dan, i got to confess to you. I'm not really giving, but let me explain why I'm not giving. He said, I have this thing that I've always wanted to buy. And I was kind of, it's like he's trying to give me this good excuse, and I'm going, oh, man. Anyways, he says, I've always had this thing that I've wanted to buy, and instead of kind of saving up for it over here on the side, here's what I'm do- I've done. I've stopped giving so that I can go and buy this thing, and once I buy it, then I'll give. And I said, well, okay, I mean, if that's what you think God wants you to do. But do you know what happened? It happened again. Yeah, 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 I'm going to give, I'm going to give, but you know what, there's this other thing that's come up, and so here's the deal. Once I get past that, then my giving will really go up, and I'm going, again, I don't even know what you give. I don't know why you're coming and confessing this to me. But here's the thing. I don't know if he ever started giving, but here's what I do know. I do know that he never started giving unless his vision got captured by God's. Because here's the deal. You will never run out of things that you want to buy. There'll always be something. It'll always be the next thing. And I get it. Some people go, when I get the next raise, that's when I'll really start giving. You know what happens? The next raise comes, and your living expands to your income. And it's the next house, the bigger house, the next car, the next set of clothes, uh, the the next uh, Apple product. Uh, It's the faster internet. It's the next thing. There is always the next thing. And the only way that you say yes to stretching, by the way, the only way you say no to the next thing and yes to God's call to stretch is if his vision becomes your priority. That's the only way. And for the people of Israel, it was the temple. And it was God's vision. God's saying, I want you to build the temple. And it's more than a building. I, I need you to hear this. The temple was more than a building. It was a solid picture of hope. It was God saying, not only here is the place that I want to meet with you, but here's the place that sacrifices for sin will be made. But get this, not sacrifices that will truly be able to pay the penalty for sin because that temple is going to point forward with hope to the one who is the temple, who comes and says, tear this body down, tear this temple down, and I'll rebuild it in three days. The one who came in the temple of flesh so that we might meet with God face to face, Jesus Christ, who came as the ultimate sacrifice to lay his life down for us, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world so that he might bring us back to God. And the temple from that point in time, even though it was torn down, even though it was destroyed, it still remains as a symbol of hope for the people of Israel who come to the Western Wall and pray and seek God, God's vision was hope. That's what he was calling them to participate in. And do you get this? See, when God calls us to stretch, you have not been called to give to a budget. You've not been called to give to meet a number on the back of our bulletin. You've not been called to give to a program. You've not been called to give to an organization. You have been called to give. I, you, us, we together have been called to give to God's vision. And you know what God's vision is? It's Matthew 16 where Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. God's vision is a community of his people on mission, together, in plain field, out into the world, storming the gates of hell, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in Plainfield and even out around the world. Jasper Reigns, our missions, global missions pastors here, we do it locally and we go globally with the gospel so that lost people might be saved and so saved people might be changed for eternity. That's what God's vision is. And the only way you're going to stretch in your giving is if his vision becomes your vision, if it becomes priority. Number two, the only way you're going to stretch, if we're going to stretch... And you need to see that this is a challenge for us together. There are things that God wants to do in this city, in Plainfield, and around the world that cannot be done unless we stretch in our giving together. See, the concern is David comes in 1 Chronicles 29. The concern is this. Solomon's about to become king. And look at verse 1. What does he say? He says, Solomon, my son. You see it? Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is what? What does it say? He's young and inexperienced. See, everybody's a bit concerned here because David's the first good king they've had and they're going, wait a minute, Solomon's taking over? And he's going to build the temple. How in the world is that going to be possible? How is that going to happen? And you know what David's response is? Here's how it's going to be possible together. 
because we do it together. And, and right now, he's addressing the practical need of finances. And, and I, I'm just going to say this, and then we're going to move on. The vision of heaven uses the resources of earth. God funds his mission through his people. The mission requires funding. It, it just, it, it's the way it is. And by the way, go back to Jesus. When Jesus and the disciples are going around and they're serving, do you remember? They had to have money. And we know it because who, who managed their money? Judas. Now, he did, obviously, a pretty bad job, which tells us of the dangers of money, but doesn't tell us that it's not necessary. It does tell us, here's the necessity. Here's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and guess what he needs as he's on mission? They need funding. If we're going to accomplish God's mission, we need funding. And not only that, understand this, the funding that's necessary to do God's vision requires everybody stretching together. It's too big for any one person. And that's where David is coming to the people and he's saying, listen, we need to stretch us together. And by the way, it starts with him. David starts and we read all, you know, he's talking about the silver for the silver things and the gold for the gold things and the wood for the wood things. And you're going, okay, please, come on, you got to move on a little bit here. But he's, he's emphasizing all of the details of what he's given. Not to brag. Not so everybody looks at David and goes, man, he's so spiritual. He does it because what he's telling the people, what he's doing is he's leading by his example, and, number, and what he's telling the people is this. I am not asking you to do anything that God is not also asking me to do. When I come to you and I say, God's called us to stretch, it's not just for you, it's for us together. And then it goes to the leaders, and then it goes to the people, and I believe that is the biblical pattern for God's call on the church to stretch. It starts with the pastor's. It starts with the leaders, and let me just talk about myself for just a moment, and I want to share with you my giving practices, and the reason I'm doing that is because this is what David does, and I want to share it with you, not so you can look at me and go, wow, Dan is so super spiritual. It's not to wave my flag and to brag and go, man, I am so great, but because, well, I'll tell you why in just a second, but look, here's the deal. Sarah and I, we tithe over 10%, 10, 10 plus percent to Grace Point Plainfield specifically. Nowhere else. And it's not that we don't give to anywhere else. We, some of our family members are missionaries, and we've supported them along the way. But we give to them above and beyond the 10% that we, the, the over 10% that we give to Grace Point Plainfield, and we do it for three reasons. Number one, because we believe that's biblical. We believe that God calls us as a family to tithe first to the church. And to the church means not to extra organizations outside of the church, it means, it, it, this is what we believe, to the local church that we're committed to and a part of. And so we give 10% plus to this church because we believe it's biblical. Number two, because we believe God's vision is the vision of this church. This isn't a man-made vision. We believe in God's vision for Grace Point Plainfield to reach this city and the world. And so that's why we give that to this church. And the third reason is because we believe that it's our call as leaders to lead by example. But again, the deal is, the vision is way too big for just me. It goes then, by the way, to our leaders, leaders in the church. And by, we've got a lot of great leaders here in the church. But the very next group of people, so David says, who's going to give willingly? Who's the next people who give? Verse, 10, verse 6, then the leaders. The very next group of people is all the leaders. Why? Because as leaders, if you're a leader, there's a, a call to lead by example in stretching yourself. And then the people stretch and everybody gives. And as a result, they're able to accomplish the vision that God has given them, which was bigger than any one person. Look, here's the deal. I really believe God has great things that he wants to accomplish through Grace Point Plainfield. Great things locally and globally around the world. You're going to hear about some local things next week, which I am just so excited about, but I'm not going to tell you anything more. There are great things God wants to do through us as a church together, but here's the deal. Unless we stretch together, and I'm speaking in terms of giving, unless we stretch together, there are things that God wants to do in and through us that cannot be done. They will not be done. In order for us to accomplish those things, God, the work of heaven requires the resources of earth, and the only way that we do it is if we stretch together. Alone, 
We can do a little. But see, listen, hear this. Together, we can do every single thing that God has called us to do as a church, financially speaking. There will be nothing that God says, I want you to do this, that we cannot do when we stretch together as a church. If we're going to stretch, we have to see, listen, if any of us go, yeah, no, I'm not really interested, we're already limping. We're already limited. We've got to see that this is us together. Number three, if we're going to stretch, we've got to see ourselves as stewards. You've got to see yourself as a steward. A steward is someone who manages the property of someone else. And what David says, and you don't see it in the part that we read, we're going to actually go through it. After the people give, starting in verse 10, David has a prayer. And in the prayer, here's what David basically says. And then we'll walk through it. We'll read through it together and see what he says. He says, when it comes to every single penny of our wealth, we are simply managing what belongs to God. All of it is God's property. And this is absolutely critical to understand if you're going to stretch, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Take a look. Start with me in verse 11. Let's walk through this. He says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. And underline this section. You've got a pen. You've got your Bible. Underline it. For all that is in the heavens and the earth is... And then circle the last word. What does it say? Whose is it? It's, it's yours. It's his. It's God's. He's saying everything. There's not a single thing that doesn't belong to God. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. In other words, everything in this world, everything that's created, it belongs to who? Who? I'm going to ask it again. We've got like 10 of you answering. That's okay. Who does everything belong to? Okay. Let's keep reading. Verse 12. Both riches and honor come from you. And you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. David says, we just gave this extravagant amount of money and gifts for the purpose of building the temple. And he says, here's the deal, God. All we did was take what belongs to you already and give it back. In other words, David says, everything that we have, it's not ours. Everything that we have, it belongs to you. And we struggle and we wrestle with this because what we say, this is the internal wrestling match. And some of you, you may be having it right now. This is what goes on in our heads. We go, wait a minute. I earned this. I mean, I worked hard. I went to college. I got my degree or I got my job and I put in my hours and you don't, I put in overtime and I, I work my butt off in order to get the paycheck and I get the paycheck. And if I'm the one who earns it, doesn't it belong to me? Well, look at how David continues in verse 15. We're talking specifically for the people of Israel in this moment, but it applies to us. Listen, he says, for we are strangers before you. And sojourners, as all our fathers were, our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. In this moment, there's a, there's a portion in this that's calling their, his attention all the way back in their history. And he says, we were sojourners as our fathers. And he's remembering this, that before they came into the land and before they had their homes and before they had their, their wealth, they were slaves in Egypt. Then they were wandering in the wilderness. Then they came to the borders of the promised land where they were disobedient. And they wandered for 40 more years as God made them wait. Then they finally got in the land and they were at war with people who were stronger and better than them military, in terms of military. And now here they are. And the question is, how do they have this land? And how do they have this wealth? And the answer is this. You want to know? It's grace. It's because God provided it for you. You wouldn't have it if God didn't give it. And the fact of the matter is this, for every single one of us in this room, every single dime, every single penny that you've made, its roots can be traced all the way back to God. Because look, look back, verse, uh, verse uh, 12, he says, both riches and honors come, honor come from you and you rule over all in your hand are power and might. In your hand it is to make great and give strength to all of you of the abilities and the skills and the power to go and do your job. The reason you have that is because God gave it to you, which means at the end of the day, everything that you have belongs to him. In verse 16, look at what he says. He says, O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. In other words, we're not owners, you are. We're the stewards, and that means we're to manage our, your property. 
And this is absolutely critical because there's a massive difference between owners and stewards. And the difference is decision rights. See, if you're the owner, you get to do whatever you want. If somebody comes and says to you, hey, here's what I want you to go spend your money on that thing over there, you can go yes or no because it's not their money, it's yours. You have the right to make a decision. But if you're managing that person's money and they come over and they say, I want you to take that money and I want you to go buy that, and you go, no, I'm going to go and buy this, what are you doing at that moment? You're stealing because it's not your property. And I want you to hear this. Malachi chapter 3, God puts it this way. He says, from the days of your fathers, you've turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return to you? And listen to verse 8. He says, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, this is much later on in Israel's history, in your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. How can he say that they're robbing him? The only way that he can say that they're robbing him is if it's his property and they're using it in a way that he has not called them to use it. You see, when God calls you to stretch, this is, what, this is why you need to understand this. When God comes and he says, I want you to stretch, he's not coming and saying, hey, listen, here's how I want you to use your money. He's not coming and saying, I'd like a little bit more of your money, please. God is coming and he's saying, here's how I want you to use my money. And there is a massive difference between those two things. And we struggle to understand that. If you're going to stretch, you've got to understand you are not the owner of your money. You are a steward of it. And here's the last thing. Here's point number four. If we're going to stretch, then we have to choose to rightly order our relationships. And we have to see that the call to stretch is the opportunity God's given us. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, at the end of verse 5, he gets done talking about all the things that he's given. And in the last sentence, it's a question, and he says this, Who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? I love that. Because here's what he doesn't do. He doesn't try to manipulate. He doesn't try to use guilt. Right? Oh, man, you know, I mean, I guess if you want to be selfish with your money, I guess you can. He doesn't use fear. He doesn't go, hey, if you don't give, God's going to punish you. And he also doesn't use force. He doesn't tax them. He doesn't go, hey, we're going to build the temple, and here's the deal. In order to make sure we get there, we're going to tax you. Because we know none of you are really going to give to it. We'll just tax you. He doesn't force it, which is interesting. I mean, here's the question that I, I was asking this week. Why not? Why not tax them? I mean, there's the risk. If you don't tax them, if you don't force it, that they don't give. Why not tax them? And the answer is this. God doesn't force you to give because he's not after you. He's not after your money. He's primarily after a relationship with you. Which means he's not just after a behavior of you practicing giving. He's after, he's after your heart. And the heart doesn't get changed by force. See, when David comes and he gives the invitation, you know what God's doing? God's giving them a test and an opportunity. He's giving them a test and an opportunity. Look at what he says in verse 17 in his prayer. David says this. He says, I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. David recognizes in this moment that what God's been doing is he's been testing the people with this call to stretch. And if you want to understand the test, and, and he's also been giving them an opportunity. We'll talk about the opportunity. But if you want to understand the test, fast forward with me in your minds to the New Testament. Jesus has an interaction with someone who we don't know his name, but he's called a rich young ruler. Some of you know the story. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds with the law. He says, well, you, you, know, you know the law, you know the commandments, honor your mother and father. He gives the list. Not all of them. And he's, by the way, he's not responding with the law because he's saying, well, if you want to get saved, you've got to actually just follow all the law. If you obey all the laws, then you'll get saved. Jesus is using the law as a mirror. And he sees in this man a blindness. The man hears the law and he doesn't get it. He goes, well, I'm doing all of that. What's the problem? He knows something's wrong, but he doesn't know what's wrong. In one of the accounts, it says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. In other words, Jesus doesn't get frustrated with him that he's blind. He looks at him and he goes, well, you've got a blind spot. And he goes after it. 
You remember what he says? He says, I want you to take everything, all of your wealth, and I want you to give it, I want you to sell everything you have, and I want you to give it all away to the poor. And in that moment, what Jesus is doing is he's giving that man a test and an opportunity. And here's the test. See, the man says he's keeping all of the commandments, and what Jesus is doing, he says, let's talk about commandment number one. You shall have no other gods before me. And Jesus comes to this man, and he says, I, your Lord, am telling you, here's how I want you to use the money. And the question is, what are you going to do? And the test is this. It is a test to reveal what's really your God, because you cannot, Jesus says, serve both God and money. You will either serve money and use God to get it, or you will serve God and surrender it to him. And your response reveals the heart. And the man's response is is that he walks away sad. Why is that? Why does he walk away sad? The reason he walks away sad is because he chooses money over Jesus. And see, this is an easy trap for us to get tricked into and even to be blind to. It's an easy trap for us to fall into. That's why Paul says to Timothy, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. See, there's lots of people who fall into this trap, and it's not money is the problem, it's the love of money. It's that we've, we've got the order of our relationships wrong where we say, no, it's money over God, not God over my money. And so when the invitation comes, when God says it's time to stretch, what he's doing is, yes, he's giving you a test, but get this, he's also giving you an opportunity to reorder, to rightly order those relationships. And understand this, your relationships cannot get rightly ordered by force. They cannot get rightly ordered by manipulation. If you begrudgingly put money in an offering plate out of obligation, you've not dealt with the real problem which is in your heart. The only way that, that those relationships can be rightly ordered is by choice. It's to say, you know what? God, you over my money. I'm surrendering it to you. And do you know that's what the people do in this moment? Look at verse 9. It says this, Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly, for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also greatly rejoiced. Why are they rejoicing? Because when they give freely to the Lord, not because it was forced, not because it was manipulated, not because they had to do it, but because they chose to do it. Do you know what it means? It means money doesn't rule us. God does. God does. See, the challenge to stretch is God saying, I want to give you the opportunity to get free. Because for many of us, money is ruling our lives. And if you want to get free from it, God says, I want you to, you got to put me in place over it. And giving is the place where you practice that in your life. And the question is, how do we get there? If it's not by guilt and manipulation and taxing and forcing, how do we get there? And the answer is grace. Because that's what they remember. They remember, you want to know why we're here? You want to know why we have all we do? Because God is the one who provided for us. And fast forward to the New Testament, when Paul is challenging us with giving, he doesn't do it with guilt. He doesn't do it with manipulation. He doesn't say, hey, this is what good Christians do. He doesn't say, hey, if you don't give, God's going to really punish you. Listen to what he says. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, as he's talking to the Corinthian church about giving to those in need, he says this. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus, see here Paul comes and he says you want to know how to have your heart changed and captured so God is over your money not your money over God. Here's, here's what you have to do. Look at Jesus. Look at the radical generosity of Jesus who took all of his riches and poured them out into your poverty you who were absolutely bankrupt, who had nothing to offer, that Jesus came and became poor for your sake so that you might have his very riches, all of his riches, not just money. We're not talking money. We're talking about the very riches of heaven, the riches of an eternal right relationship with the living God. Jesus has done this for you. Look at that and here, realize this. Money has never and will never do any of that for you. When did money die for you? When did money give you forgiveness? When did money ever truly satisfy your longings and your needs? When did it ever give you lasting stability without the question mark in your mind going, when's the next economic crash and I'm going to lose all my money? When did money do anything that Jesus has done for you? The answer is never. 
and it never, ever will. But Jesus has already done that for you. Paul says, think on these things, and now, now decide. How is God calling you to stretch? And here's the great thing. When your heart gets captured and you get involved in stretching, you know what God does? Remember, this series is when God rewards. God rewards in the context of the stretch. When you stretch, you know what God does? He blesses you so that you might be a greater blessing. That passage in Malachi chapter 3, it's a little bit convicting, right? Let me read the rest of it to you. God just gets done saying, but are you going to rob me? And then he says this, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. It doesn't stop. It's not just talking about for us. Listen, he says, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. God says, go ahead, test me. When you stretch, see if I don't pour out blessings into your life so that you become a blessing, not just so that you're blessed, but so that you become a blessing to everyone around you. Second Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says basically the same thing, just in another way. He says this, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. And listen to this. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. You will be enriched in every way to be, not so you can have more, not so that you can put it away more, not so that you can fill up your barns and storehouses. He says you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. God wants to reward. God wants to bless. It happens in the context of stretching. And this morning we're talking about giving. And here's the question that you've got to ask. Here's the question we have to ask. Because it's for us together. Will we stretch? Or will we settle for less?